Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the May 2022 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook and discussion of Workplace Organizing Basics by the UK section of the IWW Labor Union. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe, and consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So recently on the channel, I posted an audiobook and discussion of the IWW Organizing Manual. That's a long file, it's almost three hours long, and it's a very detailed look at how to organize and execute a workplace union campaign, whether it's for full union recognition or to organize around a single issue. It doesn't matter, a lot of the principles are the same. However, I thought that, well, first of all, it's a long file, so people wanting a shorter, briefer look at, you know, just getting started might appreciate something like that, hence this file. Also, I thought that the organizing manual was a bit scant in a particular area, which was actually setting up the core of what the IWW calls a job branch or the organizing committee, the core nucleus. Like, how do you go from one disgruntled worker or just one class conscious worker, which of course can lead to disgruntling on its own. But anyway, yeah, how do you go from that lone individual status or maybe there are two of you, you know, a friend of yours that's on the job or something like that. How do you expand outward? How do you safely, or at least while reliably taking as low risk an approach as you can that is actually still going to get you somewhere, find the other people that you're going to need to get this thing up and running? Well, I think that this particular guide patches some of those holes in the early part of the process and fills in any of those gaps. So hopefully this is useful both in its own right as sort of a brief taste, brief introduction, and as a supplement to that larger organizing manual. So let's get started. Section one is mapping. Learn about the workplace, talk to colleagues, and form an organizing team to build workers' power. This is the first in a mini-series of articles where we try to demystify workplace organizing by presenting a clear, methodical approach. It begins with workplace mapping. So what is that? Knowledge is power. Workplace mapping is a process to learn about the workplace and to visualize it. It helps you to understand the geography, the social networks, and the work process itself. This knowledge will be invaluable as it will inform any strategy for a workplace campaign. Mapping means several different things. 1. Gathering contact information. Collect contact information for as many workmates as possible. There may be a web page with a long list of colleagues' email addresses and phone numbers. If there isn't, instead of asking each and every worker, try to be creative. Maybe you could distribute a petition about a local cause and ask your colleagues to sign it. Beyond this, it's a good idea to get copies of different workers' contracts and the company's policies and procedures. Remember to be discreet. So that's the end of point one. I actually have two comments about this, and this is an odd note to start off on, but I'm going to be fairly critical. Number one, that does not need to be your first step at all. The other steps that you're going to see involve mapping the workplace, and they really don't involve contact with anyone. They just require standing in the facility and being observant. So there's really no reason that you would have to start or you know make step one talking to people and gathering contact information. I think that that's actually a fairly difficult step. So let's maybe move that down the list a bit. Point two of comment and criticism is I'm actually a bit shocked that they put in the point about distributing a petition about a local cause for the purpose of gathering contact information. Nobody likes having their information sold or otherwise used for purposes other than the purpose for which it was given. So especially in a union situation where you're asking people eventually to trust you and, you know, to trust the organizing committee and things like that, this just seems like an oddly deceptive note to get started on. One that could potentially be used against you in rhetoric by the opponents of the union. There are almost always opponents of the union, somebody who is friends with management or just, you know, ideologically uh, opposed to the union or they think they are or whatever. Um, you, you're not going to wind up with like a unanimous um, backing of the union at the start. And, you know, you don't really want to set it up where people can make it out like, oh, look, they've been 
lying to you. That petition wasn't really a petition. It was just to get your contact info. So I think that's a very strange inclusion on the list. Uh, anybody feel free to leave a comment. Again, I'm not saying that it couldn't work. I'm saying that it's a very odd note to start off on, especially when gathering contact information does not need to be your first step, and especially not for everyone in the workplace. Just, I, I find that odd. So those are my two comments, and yes, I do have some experience doing things like this. Continuing, point two, charting the workplace. Survey the physical layout of the workplace. Draw it out on a big piece of paper, starting with your own area of the building, your desk, cubicle, workstation, office, whatever it is. Mark out the entrances, fire exits, and windows. This is very important. A snitch could eavesdrop from an open window. Include details such as desks, walkways, cubicles, machines, and conveyor belts. Where is the boss's office? Where is the bathroom? Where is the cafeteria? Where is the break room? Where are the changing rooms, storage rooms, cleaning cupboards, stairwells? Where do deliveries take place? And then, it's time to add motion. Mark out the flow of movement, the route that workers commonly take. You can draw them in different colors for different groups of staff. Which few rooms does your supervisor flitter between? Are there particular areas that get crowded or bottlenecked, such as a junction between a couple of main corridors? Do people often hang out on the main stairwell? Are there specific places that certain workers congregate? Ask tactical questions as you're charting your workplace. Would it be safe to have a confidential chat in the smoking area? Where is out of earshot? Where is out of sight? Where can you see people coming from, from a long way away? And that's the end of point two. That's pretty straightforward, and again, you can get started with that right away. I would actually make that point one. Point three, economic mapping. Learn about the production process itself, the things that have to get done in order for a product to be made or for a service to be delivered. To put it another way, work is already organized by and for the bosses. You need to learn how it's organized. Though not as many of us work in traditional factory settings as in the past, if you don't, it can be useful to think of your own job in a similar way, like a factory, as a thought exercise to get your brain on the right track. Which specific tasks need to get done, and how is the overall workforce divided up to do them, and in what order if there is an order? Are there different departments? What do they do? Which tasks require lots of workers to be concentrated together? What are the raw materials? Where do they get delivered? And who delivers them? Think creatively and strategically. What would happen if this or that group of workers suddenly stopped working? If the receivers and other people working at the delivery gates did a slowdown, who would it affect? You will quickly realize that the production process goes far beyond your own workplace. This is why industrial unions and the IWW method is so vital. Which other workers and workplaces do you think you should eventually try to link up with? If you're a cleaner, have a look at the brands on the side of the products that your supervisor orders in bulk. Where do they come from? Does the chemical factory have a workplace union? You could reach out and form a relationship with them if so. If you work at a pub, do any local brewery supply you? Which company delivers the barrels each week? You should ask your IWW branch for insights. A fellow worker might know someone, or you might even be able to convince a wobbly to salt or deliberately go in and try to organize that workplace. So that's the end of point three, but vocab word, salting. This is when people with some kind of experience with union organizing go into a workplace and get a job there with the specific purpose of initiating or assisting with a union organization effort. You know, people might be wondering why I have specifically chosen IWW organizing manuals as sort of the bread and butter of what is at the channel as far as union organization goes. It's because that union, in addition to being anti-capitalist rather than class collaborationist, has a real emphasis on organizing workplaces from within and on the sort of, you know, everybody can be an organizer type of idea. So some unions try to organize the workplace from outside. They send in paid organizers that, you know, work full time at the union and, you know, they rely on sort of armies of lawyers to do a lot of the stuff. That's not the way that the IWW does things. So the way I look at it, you are already working a job. You are already inside a workplace. Might as well teach you how to organize that workplace. That way you don't have to rely on some paid professional. 
And even if you do, eventually when it comes, you know, if your campaign is successful and you're looking for full union recognition, if you do decide to associate with one of the larger unions, what the IWW calls business unions that do have paid staff and all that kind of thing, um, even if you do go that route, by learning these techniques and exercising them, you're going to have a stronger union and you're going to have the ability to do job actions and other things that make sure that your union is actually a fighting one. So, in other words, putting the tools directly in the hands of workers, I think, is a more radical and revolutionary approach. Like I said, you're already there. You're already in a workplace. You don't have to go on some crusade to, like, organize the masses. You are the masses. You're working stiff. If you're in a workplace, might as well try to flip that workplace to your advantage. And by your, I mean collectively the entire non-management workforce. That is fundamentally what a workplace union is about. You start off with most of the power concentrated in the hands of the owners and their managers, who act as the owner's agents. The owners have all the power. Why? Because they have legal ownership of the business, the right to the profits, the right to hire and fire, all that stuff that's protected under capitalism. But by organizing and using that organization to withhold labor en masse in strategic ways, the workers can shift the balance of power towards the workers and reorganize production to some extent to be much more favorable to the workforce. Eventually, we're going to have to get rid of capitalism to get rid of that legal right that the capitalist has to the business. But in the short term, we do organize for better conditions and better pay. And that process, even the early building block stages of it, can really sharpen class consciousness and, if it's successful, give workers a taste of the kind of freedom that is on the other side of getting rid of capitalism. All right, continuing. Point four, social mapping. This is a vital part of mapping. Learn about the people you work with. Who's friends with who? Who's the boss's relative? Who is sympathetic to a union? Who might be a snitch? Are there social groups? What are the common languages? And who speaks them? There will be a lot of crossover with the economic mapping. Workers in close proximity will likely form their own friend groups. Because it's who you work with. It's who you talk to. The cleaners will probably all be friends, and some of them will be pals with the forklift drivers. The forklift drivers go all over the work site, and this driver is good friends with this person, that driver absolutely hates that manager, etc. Or if you're in a restaurant, who works in the kitchen together? Who works out front together? Who's usually chatting with whom? That kind of thing. This information will help you decide who to talk to first when you start forming your organizing team. It will also reveal who you should probably avoid. Point five, identify social leaders. Figure out who is well-respected and influential. Who's the person that everyone goes to when they have a problem? Does anyone have a history of standing up to the boss? Are there some workers who are very popular and get along well with lots of colleagues? However, whether or not a worker is influential goes beyond their sociability. It can relate closely with their role in the production process. As hinted above, the forklift drivers go all over the place. They probably know loads of people in different circles. They might be able to pass information between workers who otherwise never get a chance to talk to one another. A popular worker in such a role would be an incredibly powerful person to have on board. Remember, if you don't get the social leaders on your side, maybe the boss will. That's a situation you want to avoid, so do whatever you can. Overall, mapping is an evolving process. As your organizing team increases, your map and your understanding of the workplace will become more nuanced with the various insights that additional team members will be able to contribute. But these basics should be more than enough for you to get started. So now let's move on to section two, one-on-one -on -one conversations. Forming relationships with coworkers is the backbone of organizing. This next piece in our mini-series about workplace organizing is all about one-to-one -one conversations, listening to your coworkers, learning about the issues, and guiding them into taking action. Comment, note that listening to them is step one. Why are one-to-one -one conversations the best way to talk to workers? Point one, everyone has their own ideas and their own specific issues. You will only find out by asking them directly. If you only discuss these things in a group setting, some people will dominate and others will not be heard. In other words, one-on-one, -on -one, 
you may hear things that people would not bring up in any other context. Point two, one-to-one -one chats are secure. You have control over the conversation. You can give out sensitive information at your discretion. It is better to find out that someone is the boss's cousin in a one-to-one -one conversation than in a mass organizing meeting later on. Point three, if you start with a mass meeting or with a flyer, you will alert the boss right away. You don't want to do that. They will start their union-busting activity before you have had a chance to lay the groundwork against it. The one-to-one -one approach means that things progress at your pace. In other words, things are still quiet at this point. Secret, in other words. Not yet public. Who should you have one-to-one -one conversations with? This can be different in each context, but you could start with the influential workers and or those who you think are probably most likely to be sympathetic to a union. If you have started mapping your workplace, and you should have, and you have a grasp on the main social networks, the information that you've gathered so far should help a lot when deciding who to talk to. However, you might find it easier to start with your colleagues who you get along well with. This is certainly best if you're nervous about the prospect of talking to other colleagues. It'll help to boost your confidence and give you practice. I would add not only that, but if you talk to people who you get along well with and they like you, even if they end up being somewhat lukewarm on the idea of any sort of organizing or you know when you talk to them and they seem very secure and happy with the job, the fact that they like you probably is going to restrain them from running off to the manager right away. On the other hand, if you talk to a more influential worker and they are like dead set against a union for one reason or another, by the way, do not drop the word union at any point this early as probably will be covered in this guide. It can really just scare a lot of people. Anyway, if you're talking to a more influential worker and they're like dead set against it, you maybe haven't talked to the boss, but you have talked to somebody with influence within the workplace who may start to inoculate other people maybe even that same day against talking to you. So keep that in mind as well. Try to include that in your sort of risk assessment of who you're talking to. When and where should you have one-to-one -one conversations? We recommend that you try to have a predetermined meetup after work or make the most of an unexpected opportunity you get out of work hours. For instance, maybe your child goes to football practice once a week and you sometimes bump into a colleague with their child there. You may be able to squeeze in a 10 minute chat in the parking lot while you both wait for the kids to finish up. It's also very common, however, for these one-to-one -one conversations to happen at work in small chunks over a couple of weeks. Ultimately, it comes down to what's easiest and most convenient for you both. If you do have these conversations at work though, be discreet, bold, all capital letters, exclamation point, be discreet. You do not want to have anyone overhear you. If you've been charting the workplace, your physical map will reveal some useful spots to have conversations, as well as some bad spots, not near open windows or on stairwells. When in doubt, you can even try to figure this out ahead of time. Where do voices carry? Can they be heard when standing in this place from this place? Actually testing that out with non-sensitive information, just seeing if a voice carries from X to Y, can save you a lot of trouble later on if you have a close call, not just in terms of actually getting busted or actually, you know, being overheard, but also just worrying. Did they overhear me if, you know, the manager comes around the corner and they seem friendly, but did they actually hear you? That kind of stuff can actually cost you sleep. So check it out. What should you say? This is where agitate, educate, inoculate, organize, unionize comes in, A-E-I-O-U. This is not proselytizing about the historic righteousness of labor's cause or anti-imperialist revolution or converting someone to a specific political ideology. Quite the opposite. You want to know where your coworker is at, so it's more about listening. You want to know what they're angry about and then try to guide them towards the positive idea that we have the power collectively to solve any problem. A vital skill to develop is active listening. Remember the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 listening, 20% responding. Agitate. Find out what the workers' grievances and issues are. What makes them angry? Ask further questions to draw it out. How do these problems impact them personally? Collectivize the issues. Offer statements like, you're not alone. A few of us are annoyed at that too. 
They might mention a problem that you haven't heard of before. If so, ask if they know of other workers who are suffering as a result of it. But be subtle. Don't, you know, whip out a notepad and a pencil and be like, uh-huh, and who else? You want to draw out a complaint, but not pry for information. So if they're talking about, you know, working with a particular machine that you don't work with is hurting their wrist or something like that, you can just ask like, oh, is it just your machine or is like everybody's doing that? You know, whatever makes sense in the situation. Step two, educate. Ask your colleague how they think things could be different. What do they think needs to change? Suggest that there are always solutions, and if you all stick together, you can take collective action to make it better. You should read up on the struggles going on in your industry across the country and around the world. If you're aware of examples of victories, share them. One way to think about the overall topic here is, if the workers ran the workplace, how would they change things different? How would they manage it? Because if you do achieve a union, that is more the situation that you will have. The workers collectively will be able to make demands about how the department or the workplace, or if you build enough strength, the entire industry is managed. Workers, by default, under capitalism, have little to no input on this process, and probably no one has ever asked them before. How would you like to work your job? What works for you? What doesn't work for you? How would you reorganize it to be better for you if you had the power of the manager? Because the union will have more of the power of the manager. So the next step is inoculate. All workers are fearful of organizing. Be realistic. Be aware of difficulties and risks. Bosses will lie and try many tactics to stop you, even illegal tactics. But if you stick together, if you're disciplined and organized, you will be safer then you would be alone. Organize. Your fledgling organizing committee needs doers, so give them a task. Have a list of easy, risk-free, or relatively risk-free jobs and ask them to do one. Hey, you're friends with John, right? Can you ask him about the recent changes to the cleaner's breaks? If they do it, they're probably a keeper. This is how you get buy-in from people. Have them commit themselves to actually doing stuff for the group that you're forming. That is how people actually become part of things, by participation. And finally, unionize. All workers are stronger and safer in a union. If you join one like the IWW, it can give you advice, education, training, and resources to support workers to take action together. Having that kind of interested, knowledgeable, and discreet support outside your workplace can be really useful to lean on. This is a long-term movement, this is how it grows, and you're not the first person who has tried to unionize a workplace. Consulting with class-conscious, union-experienced people from outside your workplace can be really helpful in reminding you of the big picture. These are the absolute basics of having one-to-one -one conversations with workmates. At first, they will be awkward, and you will probably make mistakes, but don't worry. You will get really good at them with practice. If you have a trusted friend who's willing to do some role-playing with you to practice doing the one-on-ones, that may be helpful also. Now, good luck and get chatting. Section 3. Building a Workplace Organizing Team This is the third in the Workplace Organizing Basics mini-series. So far, you've learned how to map your workplace and how to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with your coworkers. Now, you need to put together a team capable of fighting the boss. Making the team. With your social map and from the conversations you've had with coworkers, you should be able to identify colleagues who are trustworthy, influential in the workplace, and want to do something to resolve problems. These colleagues will be the basis of your workplace organizing team. Comment there. The wanting to do something to resolve problems is a key step. Not everybody who is unhappy with the workplace is going to be willing to do that. That's just something you're going to have to accept as a union organizer. It's frustrating, but people, let's put it this way, there's a much lower threshold for complaining than there is for doing something about it. Not everybody who complains is willing to actually step up, at least in the beginning. They may be supporters of the union later on, so if you have your one-on-one -on -one and people say, you know, I don't know, it's too risky, whatever, don't get mad at them, at least not to their face. Of course, what you do privately is your business. But, you know, thank them for their thoughts and taking the time to talk to you and leave the door open for something in the future. Remember, you're planting seeds here. 
But while you're waiting for some of those seedlings to sprout, you are going to need some other people on the gardening team, let's say. And odds are you will have found at least a couple of them through your initial round of one-on-ones. The first step is to bring them together. Have a meeting to introduce yourselves and plan a set of ongoing tasks. You should try to include these coworkers in the mapping that you've already started and help them to have their own one-on-one -on -one conversations with other coworkers. If you're a member of a union like the IWW, invite them to join too so that you can all have training and receive ongoing external support. Get them clued up so that you can begin to act as a unit. After you've got your small team going, you should be able to spread across the workplace. Make use of all your skills, contacts, relationships, and clout. Talk to colleagues in different departments, zones, language and social groups, and learn about the main issues across the workplace. Not just problems that workers are having, but just what's happening, what's new. Remember, you're trying to shift power within this workplace. Knowing what's happening, good and bad, is vital. You and the rest of the new team should meet regularly to discuss progress and to support and encourage one another. After each meeting, everyone should have a task to complete that week. The tasks do not need to be daunting. They could be as simple as just getting a phone number for one of the kitchen staff who seems pretty solid. Try to find a balance that keeps everyone involved and valued while not getting burned out. There is no need to rush, so go at your own pace and be sustainable. As is discussed in the longer IWW organizing manual, establishing a union is a long-term project, so you have to be patient, but you have to also balance talk with action and keep things moving forward, even if slowly. As your efforts proceed, continue to invite workers you feel to be trustworthy into the team. As it grows, you can gather a list of common grievances and get more of a feeling as to which groups and individual workers are angry and want to do something. The right kind of anger, used constructively, in calm balance with your overall set of interests, can be a powerful motivator for pushing through difficult conditions. Once you've got the people there and you're ready for that struggle, it's time to start planning your first campaign. Look through your list of grievances. Which issues impact which workers? You might decide that you need more experience and confidence before going after a big problem, so you could practice by tackling a small and simple problem first. On the other hand, there may be one overriding problem that a lot of workers have, and for which the members of the organizing team came together in the first place. There's no perfect blueprint as to how you do this, but you need information about the issue itself. What is it specifically? Who does it impact, primarily? Are there additional problems that are caused or made worse by it? Think power. Who has the ability to resolve the problem? Is there a reason for why they might not want it to be changed? Think about the alternative, what you would like to happen instead. The IWW advocates an escalating strategy. Start with the simplest, easiest, least risky tactic. Try a collective letter signed by all of the workers impacted, clearly stating the problem and what should be done to resolve it. Include a date for when you expect a resolution. So comment. Um, read the IWW organizing manual before attempting this. So now we're actually at the stage of confronting the boss and revealing to the boss that some kind of organizing has been going on behind the scenes. You do not necessarily want to, at this stage, divulge to the boss through a set of signatures, for example, who all has been, you know, conspiring behind their back as they're going to see it to change conditions. In fact, the IWW organizing manual, when discussing things like A cards and getting workers to sign A cards, you do not want to get, I mean, it says explicitly, you do not want to give a list of union supporters to the boss. This being your first campaign, you may have many struggles ahead, all the way up to union recognition. This is not the time to be giving the boss targets to start picking off key members of your organizing team. I'm a bit surprised that this was put in there. What I suspect is that its inclusion here is a result of simply aiming too low. I mean, if you think that your first campaign may also be your last, then I guess go for it. But if you are trying to do this as a long-term process involving full union recognition, do not hand over a list of who are union supporters, especially who's on your organizing committee, to the boss. So, 
I guess I would say before taking action like this, um, you need to read more than just the basic organizing guide. If you have external organizational support, now would be the time to consult with them before taking action. There are really a lot of things to consider and you don't want to run off half cocked. For example, if you're in a large workplace, say 100, 150 employees, um, this really needs to be much more carefully coordinated. If you have a small workplace of say like 15 employees and you know 11 of them are on the organizing committee, then okay, maybe it's time to take your stand. But don't just read this basic organizing guide and do that because you could really wind up shooting yourself in the foot. So while the example here uses a collective letter signed by all of the workers impacted, clearly stating the problem, et cetera, et cetera, um, I mean, you could easily just do less obvious things like a few people just refuse to do a particular thing on a particular day, but you don't necessarily tip your hat that there is a union in your back pocket. So, I mean, that, to my mind, is more in line with the escalating strategy thought. Um, you know, I think actually starting with a signed letter with all the employees' names on it who are impacted and opposed to it, that may not actually be like the lowest impact starting point. So anyway, a few thoughts on that. I would definitely uh, advise strong caution about that. Continuing, if this doesn't work, you should progress with tactics that move into the terrain of direct action, starting with the least risky. Here are some direct action tactics you could use. Remember that you can do so much more than just striking. So comment the link there when it says, here are some direct action tactics. This is to a guide called Organizing Direct Action. It also has appeared as a pamphlet called How to Fire Your Boss. That is available as an audiobook on the Socialism for All channel here. Just to cover a couple of the highlights, basically the concept is a lot of people think of what does a union do? Strike. Well, no. There's a lot that you can do that is short of a full-on work stoppage or walk-off. You can do a slowdown. You can work to rule which is where a lot of times in certain industries, uh, company policies or regulatory guidelines are not followed in order to you know, hit production timelines and profitability and all that. Well, actually just following all the laws and rules and regulation sometimes can result in a slowdown and you're actually doing your job properly and can't really be reprimanded for it legally, uh, but it is hurting the employer and it is a deviation from business as usual. There are other kinds of sabotage and other things, but check out the pamphlet. There's a lot you can do without, you know, declaring a full-on strike and walking out. Don't think that, that is the only thing that organized workers can do. It is not. Next, expect union busting. Once your employer catches wind of what is going on, one way or another, whether it's <laughs> by your choice or whether they just bust you and figure it out, your employer will try to stop you from organizing and campaigning, legally or illegally. And remember, in the United States, Workers have the legal right to organize. There's a concept called protected concerted activity. Look it up. It means that if you and at least one other coworker, or even just you, but on behalf of not just yourself, on behalf of yourself and at least one other coworker, whether or not they're doing it with you, are trying to address conditions, that is a legally protected right. Now, how much the government is going to stick up for your right to do that and protect it and enforce it, that's a different question that can vary, but you do have the legal right. And just so you know, as far as it varying, a lot of that can be in the timeline. So agencies that regulate labor disputes like the NLRB or state level equivalents, if there is one in your state, not all states have one, whoever has jurisdiction, they usually will you know, follow the stated law, although they may do it six months or 18 months later. So, you know, you may get back pay for a wrongful firing if it violated your right to, you know, engage in concerted protected activity, but you may have to get another job in the meantime. So just a heads up there. Continuing. This union busting can take many forms. It can be hiring an independent, quote unquote, consultant to kick issues into the long grass. It can take the form of getting workers and supervisors to organize against you. It can be holding captive audience meetings that you're required to attend, basically anti-union brainwashing. Stores like Target are kind of famous for this. If you look up Target anti-union videos, they're kind of um, sad, honestly, <laughs> like that anyone would be swayed by them. They're fairly ridiculous. 
It can take the form of pressuring workers individually with sob stories to guilt them out of taking action. And sometimes they can just straight up illegally fire you. Your workplace organizing team needs to read up and be aware of the various tactics that a boss will use and try to inoculate your colleagues against them so that they're less effective. The union busting playbook, and I'll put a link to that in the video description, it's unionbustingplaybook.com is a fantastic resource that organizers should become well versed with. Basically on their front page they have eight uh, things that union busters will often do. None of them are really brain surgery. It's not super sophisticated, but a lot of times they're effective so they do use them. Now if you have maneuvered around the union busting and your campaign goes on to be successful, do tell colleagues about it. Little victories not only make our work life easier, they also give us confidence and show that we're not powerless. You can inform workers about wins in a subtle way so that you don't bait the boss into retaliating against you if you're gloating. But of course it's vital to continue to inoculate workers that the boss could start union busting again at any time. Okay, so comment. The next line is pretty key and I feel like just as far as editing this thing, this should have gone way up to the top because you know, again, it prompted me to have a whole discussion about this up front. They say, it is not worth telling the boss, we are a union, until you cannot achieve anything else without needing to do so. So, the next sentence is a conclusion sentence. So, I feel like that was a hugely important point that they really buried at the end, without further discussion. Let's say that again. It is not worth telling the boss, we are a union, until you cannot achieve anything else for your workers without needing to tell the boss that you're a union. So I think that that point is crucial. It bears a lot more discussion. That's why I discussed it up front. The whole question of going public is enormous. In fact, if you're not pursuing union recognition, there are people who argue that if you're just doing a minority or solidarity unionism, that is, um, you don't feel confident that the union can fully spread across the workplace and you would rather just try to work from the perspective of having a minority of workers on your side and just try to uh, sort of make shifts easier for everybody in a more covert way, like just for your five or ten member organizing team, then you may never go public. You may never confront the boss of like, hey, we're organized for at least a while and it could be six months, nine months, whatever. That could actually really hurt your ability to get things done and to make the workplace more tolerable, survivable, so you can keep getting that paycheck. So, yeah, I would strongly encourage that be moved up to the top and be given a paragraph or two of discussion. Just my two cents. All right. In conclusion, in this mini-series, you have learned how to map your workplace, talk to colleagues about issues, and make a team to fight back. You now have the basic tools to build the power of the working class, so get organizing fellow worker and again i would add there is also the full iww manual i would highly encourage reading that uh, but before we end this video we also have some bonuses so there is a part four bonus tips for organizers the final article in our mini series about the basics of workplace organizing is here below is a list of additional hints and tips from experienced organizers they should nicely complement the organizing method that you've learned from the previous three pieces. First, do no harm. This is the Hippocratic Oath for organizers. You're dealing with your own and your colleagues' livelihoods. Be patient and do not take unnecessary risks. Keep a diary. Be consistent, be on time, and do exactly what you say you will do. Do not take on too much work for yourself and do not make promises you cannot keep. It is better to work a little bit slower than to rush around and leave things unfinished. I would add to that, I'll put a link in the description, the IWW actually produces a job journal. It's specifically formatted to help workers keep track of their existence within a workplace, their interactions with management, all that kind of stuff. I would highly encourage using that if you are serious about taking on organizing work of this type. Get people active. Workers develop and build confidence through activity. Is someone interested? Have a small task ready that they can do. See previous pieces about mapping and one-on-ones for ideas. Don't patronize people or treat them like small children, but also don't always presume that they know exactly what to do. Start with small, easy tasks and then scale them up. Take coworkers where they're at. 
Listen to workers and see where they're coming from. Don't presume to know their opinions, and don't presume to know the reasons for them. Try not to totally write people off if they're bad on something. Chances are that they can be moved or influenced eventually. However, you don't have to put up with bigotry or other abusive behavior. If a colleague is being disrespectful, you could ask if a colleague or coworker who gets along with them can talk to them about it. Otherwise, it's really not worth the stress. Just move on and concentrate on better workers. There is recognition, and then there is recognition. Being the official bargaining unit with, quote, formal recognition means literally nothing if workers cannot enforce it. However, if you are trading problems in exchange for better conditions and you have got your boss sweating, you are being recognized. So just a comment, I think that that's straightforward. They talk about this a lot more in the longer manual. But basically, you know, you can get uh, what they call a business union that, you know, you get a formal contract with the boss, there's formal recognition, whether there's a contract or not. But you get formal recognition and they have to bargain collectively with you. No more individual raises for people, things like that, etc. But if your union, the actual people at your workplace who are engaged in this organization, can't actually enforce their will, then what does formal recognition mean? On the other hand, even if the boss, the owner, or their manager, whatever it is, refuses to actually recognize you as a union, but the organized workers actually have enough sway on the shop floor that effectively in practice you are dictating conditions to the boss protecting against firings and doing the job more in the way that the workers want to do it then that is recognition of a sort the ideal thing probably is to combine them both in other words to have a fighting democratically run union where the member workers actually do run a lot of the conditions of the workplace and the boss openly recognizes that you do building up that strength is largely about showing the boss who is boss on a regular basis. An injury to one is an injury to all. The aim is to shift the balance of power from the boss to the workers. Helping someone with an individual case such as a disciplinary action is important, but it won't change conditions overall. The boss needs to know that an individual problem relates to everyone in the workplace and that all of you will cause trouble until it's resolved. Be prepared for setbacks. Things won't always go to plan, but that's okay. Be patient. Workers, bosses, and opportunities come and go. Analyze conditions. Something out of the blue might tip the balance in your favor. Remember to keep inoculating so that setbacks are less harmful. Be positive. Have a sense of humor. Try to make organizing a pleasant alternative to work itself. All workers know a lot about how grim the situation is, but there's no point dwelling on it. Try to be positive. Your vision, humor, and conviction can convince workers that you can all win. Organize the working class, not just the left. When you are drawing up your social map, you can note whether someone seems to have left-wing politics, but there may not be as much to be gained from it as you might think. Certainly do not recruit a worker to the workplace organizing team or to the IWW merely on the basis of their existing leftist identity. The apolitical or even conservative-minded person you least expect might end up being a superb organizer, while the person who talks a big game might end up being useless. So there's a link here to another article called The Left-Wing Deadbeat. And I'm not going to read this article. I didn't really agree with the article, based on my personal experience doing this kind of stuff. Actually, my experience in unions and co-ops and things like that was definitely the more a person had a pre-existing left orientation, the more likely they were to be successful in the collectively oriented team environment, democratically collaborative environment of the union organizing committee. Are there flakes and imposters in the left? Yes. Are they kind of more the exception? I think also yes. I mean, you have people like, you know, the Voschites who claim to be like anarchists and then are sort of just um, edgy Democrats at best. Obviously, beware of people like that. But I think that this article was far too harsh and you can read it if you're interested. I mean, I'm putting links to the original things. You can get the link off of that. I think that there are going to be exceptions. And then 
conversely, there may be some exceptions like, oh, somebody who thought they were conservative ended up being a good union supporter. However, I think that, well, first of all, in my experience, that has definitely not been the case. Uh, one union that was the most successful that I was involved in nearly got tanked, or actually a conservative person who caught wind of it deliberately tried to tank it. So yeah, not everybody who claims to be on the left is going to be the perfect union organizer, and some of them may flake out on you entirely. Some of them may even hurt you. In my experience, though, this is basically not a true premise. It's the more likely somebody is hungering for social justice, democracy, socialism, whatever it is, the more likely that they're going to be better in this type of environment. I would also add that while conservatives, you know, cops have unions, <laughs> do we consider cop unions to be socially positive? You know, just because people can work together does not mean that their aims are, you know, so you have to ask here, um, what is the goal of our workplace union? Is it merely conditions? Do we see this as part of some larger left project against capitalism, against racism, against sexism, because guess what? The history of the U.S. labor movement, and which the IWW stands against, by the way, is a history of racism and sexism, and there are so many, just countless examples of that. So, I mean, we did cover bigotry earlier. Um, where do you think you're most likely to get that kind of bigotry from? So, yes, on the one hand, we're talking about trying to survive your job and, you know, to fight back against surplus value extraction and get more of the fruits of your labor and all that kind of stuff. On the other hand, socialists, anarchists, even well-meaning sock dems, you got to ask yourself, what kind, qualitatively, of union are you trying to do? So, overall, on that point, I would conclude by saying, assumptions in any context about people or not about workplace organizing, or not, can hurt you. So look at what's in front of you, use common sense, and don't be opportunistic in a way that compromises core values. All right, next point. Quit the ideological bickering. Similarly, do not get caught up in political, ideological, and historical tiffs. Demonstrate your methodology through your activity. This is a general point for all organizers and activists. What Lenin or Kropotkin said on this or that means nothing if there is no organizing going on. So a couple of comments on this. I generally agree. However, point one is I think that the IWW maybe should look in a mirror because while technically they are an industrial unionist organization, the amount of anarchist ideology that is suffused throughout it I think is off-putting to say the least. If the idea is, you know, not to be a niche thing, but to embrace workers who may be more apolitical, uh, that's great. But I don't know that the approach in practice actually works that way for the amount of like anarcho-syndicalist stuff that you get hit over the head with immediately upon sniffing around IWW material. And if that's the way that they want it to be, then that's fine. But don't pretend that it is somehow ideologically neutral, because I do not think it is. So, I mean, point two, obviously we do have a lot to learn from theory and history. But, you know, I agree that trying to gain traction against the management at Dairy Queen is probably not the time and place to have your workplace union dissolve over, you know, people calling each other tanky and stuff like that. So... You know, I guess I was going to have more of a distinct point, too, but let's just say a call for ideological tolerance, including from anarchists. I think very important here. But, you know, if you're not in the IWW and stuff like that, again, I think that these are just good tactics. I'm not necessarily telling people to run out and join the IWW at all. Uh, but studying these tactics, you know, workplace mapping, one-on-ones, all that stuff, uh, you never have to have a conversation about Kropotkin to do any of that. Continuing. Be specific. Work towards clear, attainable goals with benchmarks and paths to success. Vague goals like raising awareness are pretty immeasurable. Organize around things that make people's lives better. In addition, when you have clear goals, it is easier to know what you have and haven't achieved. Take stock and enjoy the victory when it comes. Build up and respect the collective process. Work through disagreements together, even if it takes time and reflection. Plan things collectively. 
Organizing teams are strong when they have a plethora of knowledge, experiences, and perspectives. Likewise, don't be afraid to disagree. Just don't be an asshole about it. The next point I disagree with to the point where I don't even really want to read it. I will read it, uh, but with heavy criticism. So, and again, what I was just talking about, the suffusion of anarchist ideology. I think that this is a prime example of it. So, protests are tacky and shouldn't be done. At worst, they are depressing and disempowering acts of mass begging. Time out, wrong. <laughs> I don't know what to, you know, um, I don't know what we're talking about exactly by that, particularly in the context of a labor union. Like, for example, is a picket considered a protest because you're making a general demonstration that's visible to the public and the media? Should unions never demonstrate support for a particular cause as part of a protest? Or should they never oppose, say, a war, uh, you know, on behalf of their uh, segment of the organized working class? This is just a bizarre, bizarre point, in my opinion. Um, obviously, direct action is really important, but they're literally saying, well, let me continue. At best, protests tend to preach to the converted and rarely engage a different audience. I don't think that that's true. Uh, in fact, my personal start on the left was attending a protest. So really, fuck off with this one. Um, just bizarre. Do not fall into the trap of endless protest hopping. Not sure that was a thing, but... There are plenty of possible direct actions you can do instead. So I don't think that that needs to be an instead. Uh, if you want to warn people about, again, protests. I, I, I just don't get it in this context of being a labor union. So again, this is published by the IWW, which is an organization. Is every last member of the IWW involved in actively organizing their workplace? Or are some people just members of it? and don't necessarily engage in active organizing, or do they maybe give up too easily, and instead use the organization as a sort of just political base, say for, you know, being an anarchist or whatever. Um, that sounds to me a bit more like this. So, uh, yeah, protests absolutely have a place within resistance culture, and uh, you're just trying to smack them down like this reeks of an ideological bent that should be discarded. So, and again, it's in contradiction to my take on the earlier statements here about being, you know, quote, non-ideological. I'd take that with a huge grain of salt. And again, in the IWW organizing manual, I think that there are saner, lengthier takes on that kind of thing. And I'll leave it at that. Remember, this document is a basic starting point. Flesh it out with more developed discussions and information on how to organize. Continuing, remember to log off. Don't rely exclusively on social media to organize. Your communications end up relying on algorithms and you might not know who has seen which message. Set up phone trees, email lists, knock on doors, though maybe not in the pandemic. Try the IWW's own WAB chat or the InterWAB forum. Ultimately, nothing beats speaking to people directly face to face. So that's the end of the bonus tips. And I think that that last one was solid advice. You know, a couple of those, they came down on pretty heavily. I think that they were either hypocritical or just not good advice in my opinion, but most of them were, again, in my opinion. And I think it's pretty clear which is which. All right, so we're going to conclude here with another bonus, which is the article, quote, we had formal recognition, but not genuine engagement on the difficulties of bargaining. This was taken from a website called organizing.work, W-O-R-K, and organizing with a Z. It was posted on that site by Marianne Garneau. And I'd like to conclude this file with this because it's going to give some examples or illustrations of trying to use these principles in practice. And again, for, you know, many more example situations and discussions of possibilities of what can happen, do see the larger IWW organizing manual. So, last fall, baristas at a small coffee chain in Michigan organized with the IWW. After quickly winning voluntary recognition from the employer, they entered negotiations. Before anything was achieved at the bargaining table, in April, the owners announced that most of the locations would be closing. Marianne Garneau spoke to Alec, one of the worker organizers from the campaign. The company is not named due to a non-disparagement clause. How did the campaign start? Last year, around this time, I was working at this coffee company. Someone had left, 
alleging racial discrimination. I didn't know the person personally. I heard about this on a podcast. A few of the other baristas and I ended up connecting with her and getting her side of the story. She quit because she found out she was making less than other people. She was given a title without any pay bump. She felt strung along. She had the help of some community organizers. There was lots of public outcry and PR management by the company, who said that they, quote, could not possibly be racist. Comment, nice way to loudly announce your obliviousness. And that this was an unfair attack on their business. At this point, seven or eight baristas started meeting regularly. The community organizers helping the worker, who had quit, put us in touch with the Ypsilanti branch of the IWW. Who did the campaign involve? There were 17 baristas total. We acquired about one new member every week. The company had four physical workplaces, cafes. One had a roastery in it. There were production staff doing coffee roasting, bagging, delivery. One included a restaurant. We were not close with the dishwashers, cooks, and servers. The campaign was across all the cafes, but only among the baristas, who were mostly white, mid-twenties to mid-thirties, and mostly educated. It felt like a bigger challenge to connect with the people in those other roles. Because the company was not large, the baristas were the majority of the employees. One day, we realized that the roster of people, baristas, who wanted to form a union was the majority of the workers. When and why did you go public? We were starting to worry about how large the group was getting and how we couldn't keep it under wraps much longer. We decided to come out and petition our employer for recognition. We did a march on the owners and delivered a handwritten coming out letter. We wrote a version for the rest of the staff and a version for owners. We wanted it to be non-threatening and so we said we looked forward to collaborating. We didn't mention the word union. We said we were affiliated with the IWW so they should be in contact with them. Editor's note, workers were helped by a few members of the IWW Ypsilanti branch. This was in October of 2018. Did you get formal recognition? Yes. When we marched on the boss with our coming out letter, we said, we'd like your response within 24 hours. We're hoping you'll just say yes. The next day, I got a call from the IWW saying they've agreed. This was our first time doing this, so we didn't know how rare that is. But we had formal recognition and not genuine engagement. The owners hired a union-busting attorney. We were told that they were now the official go-to person if we wanted to have any negotiation. We started meeting with management in November. The attorney and one of the owners would meet us in these negotiating sessions. The sessions were very civil and even promising at times, but we didn't even have a tentative agreement by the time things fell apart the following April, so about six-ish months later. We thought about what would make the workplace better, how to have dignity as baristas, and we would write that into the contract language and bring that to the table. And the only thing we were met with was cookie-cutter stuff, which didn't even correspond with what the owners presented their beliefs about the company to be. Management will have sole discretion, dot, dot, dot. We were trying to provide solutions specific to our workplace, and we were getting back this generic management rights preserving language with no gains for workers at all. Why don't you think the company was willing to concede anything in bargaining? The initial response was that the business was in some legal precarity. They had just undergone this campaign to hold them accountable for their actions when the other worker left over allegations of racism, and that felt threatening. That was the first time the company had been publicly scrutinized in that way, and the expense and embarrassment of that. But that became an easy crutch of, we don't want to deal with the employees. They brought in the lawyer as a kind of, quote, mediating force. But once we became proceduralized, they felt safe in that bureaucratic protection. There was no genuine collaboration to resolve specific problems in the workplace. For example, when we began negotiations, our first uphill fight, which surprised me, was that we wanted a clause in our contract that you can only be disciplined or fired or even denied raises for concrete reasons that have to be written down. We wanted to document an equal system. I still think that that's eminently reasonable. Unfortunately, management and owners did not agree. They balked at the just cause clause. I think they found it threatening because we were the ones proposing it. We kept saying, this is for our mutual benefit. Some of our proposals were just for our benefit as workers, but some were for both. We were trying to help the bottom line. Comment, and how far did that get you? (laughs) Was that a good idea? What do you think it takes to get concessions from management? I can tell you what the answer is not. It's not market rationality. 
Some of us naively thought, if we can find a way to make this a fair or growth-oriented proposal, it will work. There was one person who had training responsibilities, and it was a big-time crunch for that person because there was a lot of turnover. It took months for people to be fully trained, months for them to be able to make certain menu items. We proposed that, at management's discretion, people could, on a case-by-case -case basis, do some of the training modules, and if they did that work, they would receive an extra dollar an hour during that training. It was still based on permission from management, but they could decide to train people in this way rather than it taking months for someone to know how to make a cappuccino. But they refused. So then I thought, wow, this is about something other than the business itself. There's an emotional aspect to it. There was no way that they could take advice from us and implement it. So you were trying to be, quote, reasonable. The psychographic profile of the baristas was conflict avoidant, eager to please, good communication skills. We used a lot of listening strategies. The message we got from the IWW was, you're being too nice. You guys are getting steamrolled. You need to stand up for yourselves. But the culture was, we didn't feel comfortable standing up for ourselves. Comment. So this is key to the whole thing. You have secretly organized. You have delivered a politely worded letter to the boss. You have attended the meetings. And the bosses don't really care that you have organized if they're still calling all the shots. If you don't stand up for yourself, if you're not a fighting, militant organization, then things like this can happen. Continuing. Now that it's over, I have to admit it's a kind of relief. I was getting very worn down. We were being strung along, and I was getting burnt out. There were definitely times where I was doing estimates, like, how much longer do I have to stay in this workplace, in this project? I didn't expect that the business would close. So comment, the out for this organizer was that the business just shut down, so end of business, end of workplace union. But where does that burnout, where is the feeling of being worn down come from? Did it come from consistent victories with the union? No. See, that's what, it, all of this is a big struggle. It's very hard to do. It, uh, you know, first of all, you've got the conditions which make people, especially in the United States and the current culture, which is a non-union culture, you have a workplace which pisses people off enough that they're interested in unionizing in the first place, which takes a lot for U.S. Americans to get to that point. Then you have the stressful, unfamiliar territory, just venturing out into the unknown of doing your first workplace union. That kind of going out on a limb is stressful in and of itself. What makes any of this worthwhile is actually the win. If you don't get the win, then you're really just going out on this limb and putting yourself through stress and degradation and kind of embarrassment for really no gains. Continuing, tell me about the business closing. We were told on a Monday that the stores would be closing. The flagship store where I worked would be closing on Friday. They were, quote, pulling out of the cafe business. They did not want to employ baristas anymore. Our understanding was that this was an illegal thing for them to do. We sprang into action. On Tuesday, the following day, a regularly scheduled negotiating session, we were told, bring your proposals for cessation. I said that there's not enough time for us to come up with a proposal. They proposed a one-week severance. Everything fell apart that week. It was a fuck you to the workers, but it was also ownership saying, we give up. There's been this weird long drama through the whole of summer of stores closing. The management and owners were almost entirely absent. Customers were furious. People were tipping us extremely well. Workers were singing out of nervous, crazy anxiety, laughing inappropriately, showing signs of psychological distress. Customers were coming behind the counter to give us hugs. People were crying. That Tuesday was the most bizarre day I've ever had. We started talking to our regular customers about how their favorite place was not going to be there next week. Someone in production overheard me talking about that, and I called the general manager who came in. She told me not to tell customers, so then I had a conniption. I did something very uncharacteristic and said, you get on bar and make these drinks, I'm taking a break. And I went outside and called the news media. We staged protests, uh-oh, protests, sorry. We staged protests at a few stores in the afternoon. Then at that negotiation, it was crazy. We had no idea who was even in the room. Grad students, people from other unions, well-known union organizers. I was on the negotiating team. We went back and forth for a couple of hours. It was hot in the room and I was so fried. One of our IWW reps asked us what our bottom line minimum was that we would accept. And one of our loudest members said $3,500.
I didn't think that was achievable, and I said, then we'd better start at 5,000. What happened next was not something that I expected. The owner and attorney came back into the room, and this member of the IWW, guns blazing, said, give everyone $5,000 or we'll boycott your business. And there happened to be another prominent union leader who organizes a coalition of unions, and they said, yup, we organize the teachers and nurses. And this picture was painted for owners. The attorney said, I see what you're doing here. You're threatening a secondary boycott. And the negotiation was over. The second day, a member said, we have to stick to our guns here and sent a message reminding management of our demand. And the attorney said, okay, I'm drawing up the paperwork. The amount of the severance was enough for someone to transition from this hourly job to another hourly job. I feel so ambivalent. They closed my store immediately on that Friday and the next store on schedule, as promised in our agreement. The third store, they didn't close, but sold. There is discussion right now in our union about whether action should be taken. The last store is scheduled to close on August 31st. Editors note this interview took place on August 16. The store did not close on the 31st. And they never promised to close the production side? Correct, just the cafes. What are your thoughts about how this ended? One question that was never answered was, why? Why do we have to abide their insane schedule? Clearly, it was inconsiderate to lay people off with four days' notice. We were expected to give two weeks' notice to quit. And $5,000 was an impressive amount to workers who were used to making $10 an hour. But it was a way to completely take advantage of our financial vulnerability. There's a very sweeping anti-disparagement clause that says you can never say anything bad about the company or the brand again, which is why I'm not using their name. We were also asked to sign on such an urgent timeline, and people who need that money and are scared about their future, it was impossible to have a fair or rational conversation. But there was some small part of it that was like, that's cool, we finally made the boss do something. But one of the ways this was not a success was management ended up completely preventing us from having a discussion amongst ourselves as workers. The group pressure was turned inward. The severance got paid out in two installments. And in between the first and second, the attorney said, you have to take this Facebook Live video down from your feed. The agreement says you will not publish defamatory information about that brand. And I said, this is old. There's a timestamp on this. We should not acquiesce. And the attorney threatened to withhold the second payment. And another member of the organizing committee caved to that pressure. They still dominated us economically, even after the business was closed. So that's the end of that example. So really, a lot of these things can be bittersweet or even just kind of sour. You know, I talked in the longer video about the organizing manual about the need of socialists, unionists, whatever, to change the overall culture. The kind of timidity that was discussed in this article, this case example, is key. If the workers had, you know, not taken that particular route, but had maybe done more on the job actions, perhaps they could have gotten more of what they wanted without the catastrophic loss. On the other hand, sounded like the bosses were absolute fucking cowards who uh, just were scared of their employees and literally were willing to dump their cafe business rather than deal with them. Now, I don't know, and there was no mention here of how profitable those cafes were. It may have been that they were using them just as kind of promotional materials for their coffee brand or whatever it was. I don't know. But when in the organizing manual, it talks about doing research on the company. You know, don't do actions during times of layoffs or, you know, during the down season when people are not as indispensable, when employees are less indispensable. It can backfire. So, you know, this is where if they had somehow gotten their hands on some of that financial information about the company, they might have seen that, you know, the cafes were just sort of a loss leader for them and kind of a headache. And they may have been looking to get rid of them at the first chance anyway. So if that's the case, you've got to plan your campaign and execute it accordingly. So those sort of possible strategic errors, which were there from the, you know, plan on paper stage onward, that's one issue. They may not have actually sized up this company properly. That's one of the reasons why earlier in this file, when they were like, start small, give a letter to the boss with everyone's name on it. Yeah, that's why I pushed back on that because they may have just read a guide like that and just have run with it without 
really, you know, they may have blundered into it is what I'm trying to say. Also, point two is a timid union is no union at all. So if you think that you're going to approach the boss and just say, hey, boss, we are a union. And the boss is just going to say, you know, drop what they're doing, extend their wrists across the table and just like, okay, I surrender, cuff me. What do you guys want to do? That's not how it works. So think of it this way. You're trying to get the bosses to do what you want. Well, how do the bosses get you to do what they want? They threaten you with firing or pay cuts or other disciplinary actions. So threats. So you have to threaten them with what? The only thing that you've got to withhold is your labor power in one way or another. The boss is there to make a profit. That's why you're there. They hired you to facilitate and make that possible for them. No other reason. The tightrope you're walking is being in that position of being exploited, yet collectively orchestrating your labor in such a way that makes the boss do more of what you want. Nobody said it would be easy. It is not. A lot of times your efforts will not even get off the ground, and if they do, they may not get very far. They may only fly a few feet, as in the case of this union. But we have to try because the alternative is just untrammeled free market capitalism stepping on our heads. We have the short-term project of improving pay and conditions and building some organization and class consciousness and maximizing all of the freedoms and rights that we possibly can claim for our class under capitalism with the capitalist class still in charge and then eventually taking the step over that line, abolishing capitalism, and then completely running it ourselves according to a rational plan and giving the capitalists new jobs in the proletariat. And at this point, it is literally socialism or extinction, so go. What do you think? Leave a question or comment below. We'll continue the discussion there. Otherwise, thanks again for listening. And thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. We don't run ads on this channel, so the patron support is vital and we really appreciate it. You can contribute $2 or more, whatever you see fit. Every donation is encouraging. They're also materially helpful. They help me to produce a greater quantity of material on this channel and just spend more time on it. So I really appreciate that. Also, once the content has been produced, engagement is important. So liking, sharing, subscribing, commenting on, even if it's just thanks or good video, all of that helps to boost the content in the YouTube algorithm, helps more people to stumble across it. And that's what we're trying to do. It is socialism for all. We're trying to make this as accessible to people as possible. A lot of people have questions about what is going on in the world today and what to do about it. What is this capitalism thing? What can we do instead of it? And we're trying to help answer those questions and steer people in the right direction. Your support and your engagement helps with that. And we really appreciate everyone in the community for all their contributions. Thanks again, and we will catch you in the next video.